Good afternoon, everyone. It really is a pleasure to be here. Uh, Jay, where'd you go? Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I'd like to know a little bit more about you, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, how many of you are graduate students? Uh, how many of you are first-year graduate students? Okay, how many of you are undergraduates? Okay, great. And how many of you have no relationship to the university whatsoever and just walked in the door? <laughs> um, actually, this is a little intimidating for me. Um, in the audience, not only um, is Professor Lund here, but Professor Moyle is here and Professor Rick Frank is here uh, from the law school. So um, I've known these folks uh, a long time, uh, but nonetheless, um, uh, I remain uh, in awe of them and their expertise. And frankly, uh, I'm glad to go first because um, um, you have a tremendous uh, number of speakers here. You will have, at the end of this quarter, uh, assuming that you all attend, and I hope you do, um, you will have uh, the people who are involved immediately uh, and directly in the formation of California water policy. And at the same time that you have a governor who is an activist and very interested in water policy and will be proposing uh, to move some fairly uh, controversial but very important um, tunnels and peripheral canals um, uh, in order to deal with the water problems of California. And it's a very controversial proposal, but it is um, a monumental one, an important one, and you will be right in the middle of that and you will have the opportunity to ask um, the people who are actually the decision makers and the movers and shakers about what's happening in California. So uh, you've picked a great time to get involved in water. Um, I know that you're all interested in water policy, which warms my heart. Um, that's really a good thing. Uh, we don't have enough uh, really good, well-trained, uh, people who understand science and law uh, and who are willing to get involved in water policy. Water policy requires commitment. Uh, things don't get settled quickly and easily in water. It takes a long time sometimes um, to do it right uh, or to do it at all. And uh, you've chosen an excellent career. It's, I can't imagine anything, in, in my view, um, as important uh, to the future of the West and the future of California than where we provide for our water supply and uh, that we do it in a way that's sustainable and environmentally sound uh, and do no harm. Uh, I think that's really important. So um, I'd like to start by telling you a little bit about um, what pulled me into water policy. Um, it's not a natural um, area for me. It was never a natural area for me. I was born and raised in urban Philadelphia uh, and I think there might have been a creek around somewhere. You know, there certainly were wonderful rivers, but you know, it rained all the time or it didn't rain. When we moved to California, however, and I got involved in the city council, uh, it was clear that water was an extremely important and uh, significant issue. And um, when I was on the city council, was the first time I got involved because um, our local creek uh, called Puda Creek uh, dried up. It was a terrible, it was a drought period. And um, from that point on, I really was very drawn to uh, the California water uh, history and policy and challenges. Uh, and that's what I want to talk about a little today. Um, I also, when I first joined the council, in addition to Puda Creek, which was a, um, uh, an important issue, um, got involved with the Yolo County Flood Control and Water Conservation District. Uh, first of all, what that is and how it's organized and its responsibilities um, uh, was very important. I formed something called the Water Resources Association in Yolo County because we never had, frankly, the cities and the county together working together. Uh, on water. Uh, we tried to pull everyone together whose interests at first blush seem very different, but in fact uh, protection of the water supply um, and is uh, something we all share. To solve one group's problem um, without causing a ripple or a tidal wave effect on countless other stakeholders, both upstream and downstream, you have to approach it from this principle of inter 
connectivity. You can't just take piecemeal one approach and not think about the fact that it's going to affect others, other groups, upstream, downstream, other um, stakeholders. So for me, interconnectedness means that proposals to divert water in and around the delta um, aren't just about the water demand and needs of Southern California or the Bay Area, but it also means the drinking water quality in Contra Costa. It means the drinking water, it means the, the um, water quality and the health of the pelagic organisms and the fish that depend on the water. It means the health of the agricultural community that has been in the Delta for many, many years. It means the communities that draw their water from the Delta. It means the ports that exist in the Delta. Um, so it means that the flow requirements or restrictions uh, that restrict water exports in the Delta protect the smelt but are equally important to other uses as well. So there's this incredible web of interconnectivity that's extremely important to recognize in water. For example, a levee. You want to strengthen a levee. If you do that, you have to be aware that that changes the nature of the water that flows past it. And what does that mean in terms of communities up or downstream? You have to have the larger view of in water policy, I believe. And once you do that, you act differently in solving problems. You make sure that you have everyone needed around the table to solve a problem. And that doesn't mean everybody wins, but it means everyone's issues are addressed and that you have everyone um, around the table. The best and most long-lasting decisions, in my view, or problems that are solved, is when you have buy-in from the largest number of folks who are affected by what you're trying to do. And in water, I think it's absolutely essential. So when you hear, listen to some of these speakers who are just, as I said, cutting edge of water policy in California right now, um, think about what they're telling you with respect to what I'm saying in terms of um, interconnectivity. Um, ask who's developing the policy? What other stakeholders are involved in the policy, are, are affected by the policy? Who wins? Who loses? Will the policy reduce risk to one group or one set of stakeholders? but increase risks to another. And if that's, that's the case, what then will be the mitigations or responses to those who are affected in a negative way? But most important, what I feel is incredibly important, is, is the process set up to address those issues of, again, interconnectedness? Or is it set up in a way that locks out or eliminates respect for and addressing the issues of um, any particular stakeholder. Be very wary of any claims about projects that will solve many, many problems, especially big ones, without a major impact to others, especially when key stakeholders are excluded from the process. The best restoration projects, processes, the re have, have had processes that have included incredible numbers of stakeholders and take a long time because the issues are complex and there are often winners and losers and the issues need to be addressed of, of those who do not win. Um, the restoration efforts that have been significant in the United States and I think um, show um, that kind of approach have been, has been Lake Tahoe, frankly. Um, the Chesapeake Bay efforts, the efforts to restore the Great Lakes, and the Everglades. 
And these weren't easy problems. They took a long time. Everybody was around the table from the local level, from the environmental, from the agricultural community, from the industrial community, if whatever stakeholders were affected, all the way up to the federal government. Everybody had a part to play in that. So this water seminar that you're going to do, as I said, that, that you're going to participate in is incredibly um, timely because here in California, um, the water contractors, the state and federal governments are proposing to take on a water project of unprecedented scale as part of the hotly debated Bay Delta Conservation Plan. And I'm going to talk about that uh, in a minute because that's really what I want to focus my attention on. Um, in my view, and I'll talk about this in a minute, the BDCP has currently, uh, currently, which is extremely unpopular in my region, the whole Delta region and others, um, would benefit from recognizing and embracing what I've termed interconnectedness of California water policy. But before I um, go to that, and I will spend some time on the Delta, um, I want to talk about two, um, a successful water process um, here, here in our community, uh, that has major, that has had um, major significance statewide, and probably should have more, and I'll get to that in a second. But since my time on the Davis City Council, um, I've participated in a couple different um, processes, water projects, uh, that largely succeeded because the proponents embraced collaboration and they focused on bringing together very diverse, very controvert, very um, uh, divided, diametrically opposed in many cases, stakeholders uh, to develop plans that would balance the environmental and conflicting, um, interconnected but conflicting interests. And Yolo County has many examples of that, but I want to talk about the development of the Yolo Bypass Wildlife Area, which provides extraordinary uh, habitat, at the heart of one of the country's richest agricultural areas, alongside one of the busiest interstate um, uh, and uh, Sacramento metropolitan area. Um, 16,000 acres of uh, wetlands restoration, probably the, I think the second largest, maybe the largest wetlands restoration project west of the Everglades. Um, this was made possible because it has been managed cooperatively for the benefit of flood control, the ecosystem enhancement, agriculture, and recreation. Often conflicting, but in fact, it works. And how does it work? Well, it worked because at its outset, which was in, you know, 89, 90, 91, um, the, the wildlife area's development was really a product of the facilitation of something called the Yolo Basin Foundation. Uh, it was a locally based group uh, who brought together divergent stakeholders to address concerns and hash out workable solutions to address the management of, to address a management plan for the wildlife area. It took a while to get there. Um, and rather than ignore the fact that wetlands restoration would have an impact on flood protection and could disrupt irrigation on nearby farms, the Basin Foundation sought to reach out to those groups and invited them to develop a management plan with multiple benefits. And through this collaboration, with great effort and over a long period of time, the management plan earned tremendous support from resource agencies, the state, the feds, farmers, local government, environmental interests, and the local community. It was an incredibly positive um, step forward. In 1997, President Clinton hailed the wildlife area project as a national model for meeting the challenge of, quote, trying to improve our economy and lift our standard of living while improving, not diminishing, the environment. It is an extraordinary area, uh, an extraordinary example of how to achieve restoration while also meeting flood protection, and the economic needs of the region. It will play an incredibly important part in the development of the Bay Delta Conservation Plan, the BDCP, that you will be looking at through the entire um, water policy seminar uh, because it is in the bypass. And the bypass is an incredibly important part 
of our flood control system and uh, extremely important uh, to the health of the fish and habitat and wild waterfowl um, and flood protection. Um, there have been other projects as well, Cache Creek, um, which used to be used for gravel mining and still is, but not in the channel, um, was subject of referenda, of initiatives, um, fights, boards of supervisors, elections, all sorts of things over years. And finally, every, and gravel companies, and everyone finally came together uh, over a long period of time, I'd say two or three or four years. Um, uh, not easily, but the plan uh, really, uh, again, uh, the management plan that was put together uh, balanced some very divergent interests. You have gravel mining, which is of incredibly significant economic uh, importance to the state of California, and you had this wonderful creek, you had fish, all sorts of things, uh, habitat, flood control. There were a number of things, and they were balanced over time. And uh, again, um, the rights of landowners um, had to be uh, mixed in with all of that. So, you know, again, um, my belief is that because there usually is no simple answer to, to big water problems, um, it's really important uh, that everybody be around the table. It's hard work uh, on, and you, you, if you're lucky, you have wonderful scientists like Jay Lund and and Peter Moyle, who guide you and give you the basis uh, of what the science is, uh, and Rick Frank, who tells you uh, what you can do in the law and what you can't do, and then you stretch a little beyond that, <laughs> and uh, you come out with a good result uh, that everyone, everyone uh, supports. Now let me talk about the Delta, which is someone described as a wicked, wicked problem, and it is, and it's not a new problem. Uh, but it is um, uh, on the table with this governor for action. Uh, so you're really um, right at the heart of this. Um, how many of you have ever been in the Delta? Oh my goodness gracious, wonderful, okay. Um, well, it's the largest estuary on the west coast of the hemisphere. It's home to over 750 species of plant, wildlife, critical nursery and passageway for 80% of California's iconic salmon. It also has five counties, two deep water ports, four million people, 27 cities, 1,000 farms, boating, fishing, highways, pipelines, and gas wells. And I'm sure I left something out of that list. It's also the point at which water from Northern California is transferred to the Central Valley and to Southern California and to the Bay Area. It's the heart of the California water system and the flashpoint of conflict in California's water wars. The state and federal governments are working with the water districts, with Metropolitan Water District in particular from Southern California and Westlands in the Central Valley, to develop a plan to divert the last major freshwater source, Sacramento River, around rather than through the Delta through massive new tunnels. Um, it used to be known as the Peripheral Canal. The proposal now is for two major tunnels underneath the Delta. That plan, which is the Bay Delta Conservation Plan, and you will have people who are, you know, that's what this semester is gonna be about. Um, this quarter is gonna be about. Um, the plan calls for 100,000 acres of habitat restoration within the five Delta counties. And despite the obvious impact on the Delta and upstream communities for the most part, these groups have been excluded from the planning process. And remember that, that's important. All those five counties, four million people, two deep water ports, 1,000 farms, um, they have been excluded from this process. And I don't say that lightly. They remain excluded from the process. The process is being driven by contractors, by those who want the water. Well, I understand that. It's an important need that has to be balanced. If the BDCP proponents are committed to such a massive project in the Delta, they need to recognize the impact on the Delta, the Delta communities, 
and the upstream water users. Risk to these interconnected communities, whether it's water rights, water quality degradation, endangered species exposure, reduced agricultural production, these need to be addressed. And while it will be extremely difficult and expensive to do so, the proponents must be willing to address, to adjust their preferred project to accommodate these other valid interests. They are valid interests. And to date, they have been unwilling to do so in my, from my perspective in meaningful ways. Upstream water users, Delta landowners, residents and organizations will be critical to the success of the BDCP. And each could potentially block critical components of the BDCP. Already you have really vocal opposition to the water bond that was developed in a process that included, that excluded the Bay Area and the Delta legislators, and which includes much of the funding for the habitat restoration portion of this giant BDCP, this conservation plan. It's unli unlike, unlikely that the bond is currently structured will ever pass. A vote on the measure has been delayed twice since 2009, and polling indicates that there is opposition, and voters are not likely to approve a measure like this without some drastic changes. And as um, uh, Jay said, uh, I am and have introduced a bill to put a water bond uh, before the people, um, which I think will pass. Uh, but again, between there and the ballot, uh, between introduction and the ballot, there's a whole lot of political process yet to go. Um, the path forward on bonds or any, any future um, uh, legislation or um, action on the Delta uh, is going to have to be uh, a discussion and negotiation with all parties at the table. Um, Delta folks are willing to do that. They've been willing to do that. Um, environmental, upstream stakeholders, everyone's eager to come to the table. And they've worked hard to engage in this process, uh, which is the BDCP process. Uh, they want to develop solutions for the Delta that will work for the water expor exporters as well as the Delta and upstream region. We'll see. Um, Governor Brown has focused his attention on the, um, the, the, the cement. You know, how do you um, divert, uh, how do you get uh, water certainty for Southern California and for the Bay Area and for um, uh, the Central Valley? And in his view, uh, the most important thing is let's just get it built, let's get this diversion built, um, this peripheral canal, these tunnels. Um, from my perspective, um, that's sort of the, that's, that's the end point of the discussion. What we really need to decide first of all is what we want this delta to be and what it will take for the delta to survive unless we've decided we don't want this delta to survive, in which case we can drain all the water. But what we have to decide and what our institutions and our policymakers have to come to grips with is how much fresh water, how much water does it take to preserve the delta the way we want. And those are very, very difficult decisions because not everybody and not everything will be the same after that discussion. There may not be as much water that can go to Southern California as they would like. There may not be as much agriculture um, left in the delta as has been previously. There may not be as many islands protected by levees as there has been in the past. We have to decide what we want and we have to figure out how much water that will take because water is at the heart of this discussion. How much fresh water is necessary to preserve the communities and the delta and the fish and the wildlife uh, and ship to Southern California. So that's the heart of it and a very, very difficult difficult discussion, but I do know that that discussion can't take place without the Delta communities at the table. I mean, it can take place, but it's not a stable result. Whatever's decided, you have to have the people that you affect involved. If you want to set up habitat, you need the people whose land you want 
to be a party to this, to be cooperative, to work with you. You want those in agriculture to do wildlife friendly agriculture, to participate with you. You want those who live in the cities and who are taking water from the city, you want them to be able to be assured. You want assurances and guarantees that they'll be able to continue, not to grow like Topsy, but to meet the needs of their cities, those four million people. So um, it is not, it's not an easy thing, but interconnected is what they all are. You do one thing in one, if you want to save this fish, if you want to uh, restore these levees, if you want to restore this or preserve this agriculture in a certain place, all of that has uh, an impact somewhere else and everybody's got to be around the table. Um, the most interesting thing that's happened after, you know, and we've been fighting about this since the legislation passed in 2009, um, and I won't go into the details on that, but what's happened is a lot of people are tired of the fighting, which I think is terrific. Um, basically, what's happened is that the, um, uh, some of the stakeholders and all, of, you know, the important ones, including the Delta counties, uh, including Metropolitan Water District and Westlands and others, the contractors, um, have been meeting like over the past six months, six to nine months, and sort of the basic premise, nobody organized them, they organized themselves. The basic premise was, well, we're not going to, we don't need to fight over the canal you know, over the tunnels, because frankly, that's not going to happen for 10 to 15 years, if ever. So why are we fighting about that now? Why don't we instead see if there are projects and needs in the Delta right now that need to be met and that we can all agree on, that there is consensus on? And lo and behold, they came up with 42 projects, a cost of about $2 billion, which in water terms is nothing. I mean, you know, in my checkbook it's a lot. But in water policy, nothing. That's budget does. And lo and behold, um, in fact I had a hearing on this the end of um, August, or no, end, end of September. September. Um, everybody's around the table saying, yeah, we can do this. We could do this. We need to look at these. These may in fact help the ongoing and immediate crises that we have in the Delta. So why don't we do those? And we, in fact, have some bond money that's left over from 2006. And maybe we need a new bond to focus on what we can do together and stop talking about the canals. Um, let's try and move that forward and maybe develop a bit more trust, which is also an incredibly important in ingredient in solving any um, policy dispute in water or any other place. So. I think that there is, um, these collaborative processes have been going along because people really are frustrated with the lack of progress uh, and the uh, focus on these tunnels that has really been unproductive, if we could ever afford them anyway. Um, so I'm going to hope that that is going to be the spirit in which I present and work through the legislature with this bond. Um, and that we support the kinds of projects that local communities throughout uh, California are asking for. There are all sorts of things, recycling, conservation, uh, levies, all sorts of things that people are asking for and want to participate in at the local level. And uh, they need the state, as we have historically, to take a part of that. Feds are out of it. The fed federal government is no longer available to us. But at the local communities, um, there are a great many interesting and important projects. And because you're in Davis, I need to end with the fact that I want you to look at and learn about Measure I, which is the local effort to take winter water out of, Sa out of the Sacramento River and use it to wean Davis and Woodland off of groundwater which is a place that we don't want to be dependent upon for the future. It's not sustainable, not good quality, mucks up the delta, nobody drinks it in town anyway. <laughs> so that measure is on the ballot um, in the city of Davis. How many of you are registered in the city? Oh my, yes, you're going to get an all-mail ballot, a mail ballot, 
Um, so please take a look. It's extremely important. You have a chance to see um, a real project uh, that will benefit the community and that will tie together many of these issues that you're going to be dealing with. Because Davis is, after all, on the northern edge of the delta. And where does our water go? We take it out of the groundwater, out of the ground, ain't so good quality. We treat it and we put it back in through the bypass and then it goes out to the delta and out to the bay. And it's not very good quality. So we ought not to do that. So here's our shot for us locally to take our action. Anyway, I'm going to be quiet. Jay, what would you like? Now we have time for yeah. sure. Q&A, I think. Absolutely, um, sure. I have a microphone here. We tested it out earlier today. You have to you know, get right up next to it. So I'm, I hope we won't communicate too many diseases here. But um, <laughs> so John Duran, the skinhead of the back. <laughs> <laughs> Bad interaction with Razor. Um, thanks for coming. It's very sure, my pleasure. You know what I'm interested in is something you said about how right the, how your um, district has been particularly excluded from the mm -hmm. PCP. And, right. And, and you know that that to me strikes me as different from my general perception, mm -hmm. in which I you know I've been involved in this issue for several years now, and I constantly hear the voices of Delta folks. Oh, sure. Up in all sorts of venues, from the water board, uh, to the blogs, to whatever. So they're quite vociferous. And I'm wondering in, in what ways they've been excluded from the actual process. Oh my goodness, from the, yeah, from the very beginning of the legislative process, um, when the legislation was put together in 2009, uh, we were uh, asked to leave the room and my name was taken off my bills. Um, you know, and they were not allowed in the room, okay? The legislation was written by the contractors in the middle of the night. They don't like to hear me say that, but that's in fact the case. And that's not unusual in the legislature. Okay. What's happened since is that it used to be the case that um, Delta counties, the only people are allowed around the table of the BDCP, that is those who determined uh, the direction, were those who agreed to a canal or a tunnel. Well, no Delta folk. Lots of folks aren't going to, you know, go into the uh, meetings under those uh, circumstances. Um, what's happened since is that, um, you know, we have a new administration, and um, John Laird and Jerry Merrill. Uh, you won't hear Jerry, but John will be here. Uh, have made a real effort to outreach to the Delta counties, and in case of one county, there has been actual you know, transfer of money to do studies in order to be able to respond to the BDCP proposals. But in terms of the actual, um, you know, formula or formation of the BDCP, no. And if you ask any Delta County, you'll find out that's the case. Yeah. Oh, we're very vociferous. We make a lot of noise. That's all we got. Yeah. It's called the bully pulpit. We make a lot of noise. But when, you know, push comes to shove, you know, being at the table, around the table, you know, not on, you know, not on the menu, you know, that doesn't happen. Do you think the environmental groups have had more, uh, more of a position at the table than the Delta groups? Well, the environmental groups are divided. Um, we've had, uh, again, this is um, uh, evolving. Uh, we've had, uh, up until this year, we've had uh, two environmental groups, uh, uh, NRDC and we've had environmental defense that have been uh, at the table, I would say. Uh, I don't know that they would describe it that way, but they really were. You know, they were listened to. Um, and then you have CR Club, PCL, you have others who really were much more um, uh, excluded, opposed, you know, just skeptical and not part of the process. Um, what's happened is that as this has gone on and the studies have come out, um, there's been um, a great deal of concern that the way this, pro this BDCP is moving is not going to be helpful or healthy for the fish and in fact um, the late, you know, the scientific information has been, and you know, I defer to Peter on this, been really of concern 
Um, and that has made the two major environmental groups that are still sort of hoping this will work um, very skeptical. And I think you just need to talk to them about it. Um, but I have watched this evolve and people are very, very, you know, uh, this is really going to come down to how much fresh water, how much water can be exported from the delta and still provide a healthy ecosystem. And I think that's where the real rub is going to come. And I don't know where the environs will be in the end. That's my view. Maybe, I don't know if Rick or Peter, I don't What's the latest? I don't know. What's the latest study? Maybe I'll ask, ask one more question down the same line. Yeah. Then, uh, yeah. Thank you for coming and congratulations, by the way, for your three appointments today. Um, I'm not a Delta person. I sort of hover down below the ground typically, so I'm asking out of community. But it seems to me the idea of tunnels in the idea of a peripheral, the, the idea of a tunnel yes. or a peripheral canal mm -hmm. is only the um, sort of the, the the other piece of having built Lake Shasta and all of the other reservoirs that we have up north. I mean, we have stored up water from winter runoff that we then ship through the delta in the summer, and it naturally wouldn't be available. So, having that infrastructure available that allows us to, in fact, recreate natural flow conditions in the delta by taking that fresh water that's coming out of the reservoirs and bypassing the delta seems to make a lot of sense on a very principal idea. So is it about how much fresh water gets mm -hmm. exported out of the delta? Because we have created this extra supply. Or is it more about who controls the timing on the baths of this infrastructure? Yeah, Very, very uh, good uh, statement and questions. Um, this is all about assurances and guarantees. Uh, it's about how much water can be diverted um, and still retain a healthy delta and what that means. Um, and uh, it's about who operates. I mean, you build a tunnel that can divert 15,000 acre feet or whatever it is for the CFS, you, you think it's not going to be used? And that amount of water to divert the Sacramento River in that, num in that amount and what do you think is going to be left? I mean, it's a frightening possibility. There's not going to be enough water uh, to preserve the health of the, of the delta. A delta needs fresh water. So, you know, it's a question of assurances and guarantees. And you're dealing with a, you know, water is just not about good policy on paper. It's about power. And this is about power relationships. And that's what was very clear in the legislature. The Delta doesn't have the same number of legislators as LA does, or San Diego, or Southern California, or the Bay Area. So, you know, the kinds of assurances and guarantees for the preservation, for the, for the survival of the Delta, you know, it's not clear yet what that would be. But I can tell you if there is a, two giant tunnels that are 35 miles long and you know, they're going to fill it. They're not going to spend billions building it and, and then and not use it. Filling it all the time. Not because using it? Just yeah, and, who's, and the thing is, who's got the power to make them stop? So far, we only have the courts. That's the only backstop, in my view. The water board's been very weak. They're getting better, but they're still weak. You know, Department of Water Resources is run, in my view, by the contractors. It's not the state's policemen. You know, I mean, I, you know, I, it's what kind of assurances and guarantees in an in a, in a area, the Delta, where assurances and guarantees haven't worked very well in the past. Maybe a smaller pipe, you know, that you could cut off. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not enough water. Good question. Um, you talk a lot about interconnectedness, <laughs> and I'm wondering if the people at the table, mm -hmm. um, the policy makers, mm -hmm. are talking about the interconnectedness of water policy and land use policy. Uh -huh. And, you know, population development <sighs> control. I mean, these are huge parts of why we need so much water diverted. So I'm wondering if that's discussed in tandem. That's a very, very good question. I wish it were. Um, 
My experience with land use legislation and water has been very, very, it's been very difficult to achieve um, that, that interconnectedness, and it really is. I mean, you're, you put your finger right on it. Um, the fights we've had in the legislature just assuring that developments will have the water they need or they don't move forward um, have been very, very difficult fights. The, the, the effort to figure out how much groundwater we have in a state like this, we don't know. I mean, it's unbelievable that we, that we don't have that information. Um, those are very, very difficult battles, but I think um, th you know, that's a really critical thing, and we haven't made much progress. It's really hard. You know, California has, not just California, but the West, I mean, private property rights are really, you know, we really cling to those, and local governments have the power on land use, and they cling to those, and I, I understand that coming from local government, but, you know, sometimes you have to make um, compromises in those areas for the greater good. Hard. Yeah. No, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Good. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering how uh, can the state legislature or policymakers, uh, state policymakers, work towards environmental justice outcomes for uh -huh. rural communities that, yeah. whose natural resources are essentially owned by large <laughs> urban areas? I'm thinking. Like the whole East central Bay, Valley. I can't remember what the, the mountain community is, whose mm. water they take. And mm. there was a proposal to have like a $10 a year add on to bills if East Bay Med customers to you know rebuild their habitat. And it's like not even a start. Oh, God. Yeah. Um, that's, a, that's an issue that is on point this year. Um, there was a report just issued, uh, one of the regional water boards, just uh, water quality control board, I think, the guy at the organization, issued the fact that there's, uh, there are millions, two million people that do not have access to good quality water. Um, and that is an issue, economic, ju the environmental justice issue is on the point. Uh, in particular for the Central Valley. In the, in the bond that I'm putting forward, the proposal, uh, we're going to have money for um, small, small water systems, um, you know, for cleanup. Uh, going to require a lot more than the, you know, the couple billion that we'll put in there, but it is an absolute need. It is a disgrace that we have people that don't have access to good quality water. And by the way, it's just not poor people in Southern California. It's communities you talked about. It's Binning Tract, north of Davis. It's North Davis Meadows, north of Davis, where you just don't have, it's extremely expensive to clean and provide for clean water. And um, you can't do it when you have a small rural community of 10 houses, 20 houses, 30 houses. It's exorbitant and unaffordable. But we have to figure out how to handle that. And this also goes to the land use issue she talked about. Um, there are communities in the Central Valley, like in Modesto, for example, there is a, um, I don't know what you would call it, an, uh, it's an isolated, there are isolated communities that have never been brought into the general planning process of the larger cities. And they, some of them don't have sewers, water drainage. I mean, it's just unbelievable. So the first step is figuring out how you get them in the general plan, which is expensive because they're poor communities, some of them, um, then let alone providing infrastructure. So it's, we got a few problems we have to deal with. Yeah. I would like to thank you for coming and, and sure. thank you for your support. A lot of thanks for your support for the Delta because sure. I am a Delta resident. Ah. And um, I, had a qu I have a question about the cost-benefit analysis. Ah, uh, yes. That's, That's great. Just begun. Yes. Because we've been screaming for one. And a good thing. Yeah. But um, I was wondering how much influence it would actually have on the pre preferred project. Well, um, yes. The Delta's been screaming for a cost-benefit analysis for uh, over a year now. And to their credit, um, uh, John Laird and um, Jerry Merrill are going to do it. And they've hired somebody who's really good, um, uh, Professor Sunling out of Berkeley. Now here's the key to this. What are they going to look at? Are they going to look at the BDCP project as proposed? Are they going to look at the status quo, which is terrible? Oh, none of us want that. 
If they choose an alternative that actually makes sense, then it will be a very interesting and worthwhile discussion for the state. If they look, and by a worthwhile alternative, I mean one that shows that you can armor, you don't need to build a canal, you can armor the delta. I don't know. You can armor the delta. <laughs> I'm, you know who I'm looking for? I'm looking for, who's our, oh, wonderful, um, you know, with, oh, heavens, never mind. Um, <laughs> no. Um, you can armor the canal, I mean the delta. Uh, part that goes to the pumps, you can screen the pumps, and you probably could uh, get by with less water. And, you know, that would be a realistic alternative. But if they don't put any realistic alternative in the cost-benefit analysis, then I'm not sure it's going to help us a lot. But it's a good thing if it's done well. We're so close, I can do another mic, but... Going back to your idea of collaboration and interconnectedness, yeah. I would just like to hear your take on the California water plan as a whole. And if that process is something you are supportive of or if there are specific issues that you see with that. Yeah. No, I thought the water plan, um, I first got involved uh, years ago in the water plan, um, uh, representing the counties uh, when I was on the Board of Supervisors. Um, so in the... Um, in the year 2000 or so, whenever that one was done. And it was frankly, um, I was really impressed. Everybody was around the table and you know, it talked about a lot of good things and uh, I was very, very impressed. Uh, the issue with all of these plans is implementing them. You know, is somebody going to read it or put it on the shelf? Um, I've lost track of what's happened since, but the idea that California should do a water plan um, is a good one. Um, and uh, if it was anything like the one that I participated in, I thought it was pretty impressive. Um, probably very controversial because probably um, didn't you know appease everybody, but um, or some powers. But it was it's really a good thing to do. Yeah, definitely. It's every five years or so. Is that the yeah? No, I haven't seen it. How's 2013 is the next one. The next one. Okay. So yeah. December 31st. Please. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> true. Anyway, thank you very much. I really enjoyed talking with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.